Before we jump into this video, I just want to very quickly say we do have channel memberships. Now, there's three tiers. First one, less than a cup of coffee from a cafe. G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so very fantastic to see you now. I join you today from lockdown. It was going to be a five day lockdown. It's been extended and I think it's probably going to get to somewhere between 10 days and two weeks. Anyway, time will tell. Now today we're going to talk about these types of images right here. Cityscapes. No, joking. Black and whites. Now black and whites are super dear to my heart. I spent from 1984 through to 2003, so almost 20 years, processing, hand processing my own black and white film and prints. And it all started for me with that magical experience of exposing a piece of photographic paper under the enlarger, then putting it into the developer tray and watching the image magically appeared. And that first happened for me in 1984, a very, very long time ago. From there, black and white's been a massive part of my life, with me having my own dark room at home and hand developing prints all the way through, as I said, until about 2003 where I went fully digital with the Nikon D70. So working with black and white and film is still more than half of my photographic life. I love it. In this video, I want to talk about what black and white means to me and why I think it's so powerful. And I want to jump into Capture One and then into the Nix software, Silver FX Pro version 3, which has just come out, and I just want to show you what I do to create black and whites in the digital age, which I think feel authentic. Something that I think about all the time is the fact that there's, in this digital world, there are so many different ways to create images now. There are endless opportunities for filters and filter packs and grain and just all sorts of things that you can do to an image. And very, very early on, it occurred to me that I don't want to spend the majority of my image making time in post-production. So I've always had a fairly short pipeline, a fairly quick pipeline of how I've gone from an image which is already very strong in its own merit, and then in this digital age, how I might make it black and white, because I do shoot everything in RAW, and I do not own one of the beautiful, say, Leica black and white cameras, which do interest me, but I simply do not have the resources to have one. Leica, if you're listening, please send me one of those things to try out. I would love to test it out. So firstly, let's talk about black and white and what it means to me and why I think it is an absolutely amazing storytelling medium. To me, the advantages of black and white are simply this. You rely on light, form, shape, perspective, framing, content, story, to create interest and create drama. This is not a for or against video in no way, shape or form, but I do think that colour can sometimes actually be distracting from all of those things I mentioned before. Just want to show you one example of the type of image that simply will not be as good unless its color. That is what this image is all about. Sometimes just dealing with contrast, texture, the light allows you to focus on the image, on the story, rather than being so overwhelmed by just crazy color, rich color, crazy skies, at times can actually be distracting. I think black and white has the advantage of it simply being that the story needs to be told with these elements. Black and white only allows us to focus on form, shape, texture, shadow, light. And in a way, in a way, it feels to me that this is actually the more pure photographic forum, medium. And I know that seems strange and counterintuitive, but at times, I find the colour can be distracting. And I also find that people use and abuse colour. They basically attempt to make an image more than it really is by just, well, going hyper colour. I suppose there's a challenge in that for all of us. 
and this is something that I've said about almost all of my images, that they work in both colour and black and white. Basically because the basis of the image is solid to begin with. It has form, shape, texture, perspective, framing, good lighting. And thus it can work either way. And I find it super interesting that in the digital age you might have a great colour image and then you make it black and white and it is even better. But at the end of the day I want to make very clear that from my perspective this is subjective. There is no right or wrong. There's simply does it work? Does it look great? Could it look better? We always have to continue to ask ourselves these types of questions. It's easy to cover something in sugar and say this is sweet, this is great, it works. But can you make it work without the sugar? Push yourself. We should always be continuing to push ourselves. Can you strip something back and still make it better than it was before when you threw everything at it? Certainly when digital photography began and maybe in the preceding five to ten years after that, and when I say began, I mean began en masse for the mass populace, let's say around the beginning of the 2000s, through to the absolute peak in the bubble, which was 2012, a lot of people lent very hard on the saturation slider. They also lent very hard on the HDR slider. And what ended up happening is we lived in a world where photographs didn't really represent what they were photographing. Well, here is just your average everyday image that already are fairly colourful because that's what sunsets are. Well, they get pushed a little hard, don't they? They can look like this, this, this. And then what happens is, is you get areas which really shouldn't be colourful being colourful, like this white goes to blue. And this fence here, it just becomes too orange. If we turn the saturation down, we can see that the white is still white. So not only do colours that shouldn't change change, but things just look unrealistic. We can see this happening time and time again. I think this image looks quite beautiful as it stands, and then you just make it look a little bit silly. Sure, it's sugary and sweet and nice and kind of lovely, but it's not real. This concrete here is not blue. It is grey. So saturation, colour, it's something that we've got to be really thoughtful about and ultimately make a decision between do we want the sugary short-term fix or do we want our image to be longer standing and in the end, ultimately, I think more timeless. And yes, of course, it could be argued that art is subjective and you can do whatever you want. Absolutely. Do whatever you want. But if it kind of doesn't look very good, again, it's subjective. So sometimes we have to create the most amazing things by doing less. Sometimes more is less. And I think that is the gold of black and white. Again, this might sound counterintuitive because in today's world, unless you own one of these beautiful black and white only cameras, you've got to do a little more <laughs> to make your image less. In other words, it doesn't come out of your camera as black and white and you've got to work on it a little bit. And that's what I want to show you today. And again, to repeat, all of these things are subjective. The images that you like and I like, they might be completely different. The only thing I ask of myself first, and I ask of you too, Never stop experimenting, never stop turning things up, and maybe turning them all the way down. And don't be afraid of black and white. Don't be afraid of when you're looking at an image and you say, oh, this is fantastic, but maybe it'll be even better in black and white. Now, one place that I think black and white would be super challenging, and perhaps this is something that we should try on in the channel together, is I think macro photography is often about the colour and the beauty of plants or insects or something small. And that's, what, that's often what's so exciting and rich about that world. So is it possible to have great black and white macro? And my answer is yes, but you probably have to choose your subjects even more carefully. Enough philosophy on black and white. Let's have a little bit of a look at how I create some of my black and white images to make them feel as black and white as I was used to in that first 20 years of photography where I was doing it under an enlarger, 
by hand using multi-grade filters to create high and low contrast outcomes. For those of you who've never experienced the darkroom and the enlarger, I had hand printed over 100,000 images over the course of almost 20 years. And it is an extraordinarily different process to what we do today. I really think everyone should do it at least once because it really helps you understand the absolute fundamental basics of how photography works, how this all comes together. And in a way, there's a certain organic connection that you make with the image when you literally fire those photons onto a piece of photographic paper, expose it, and then bring it to life chemically. There's a certain magic about it. Might I just conclude before we jump out of this that I'm not interested personally in doing that anymore because I spent thousands and thousands of hours in the dark room. I'm happy not to be in the dark anymore. Let's hit it. Let's have a little bit of a look at some colour images that I shot recently on a foggy day here in Melbourne, out with the family, and these. this is the sort of day that I just really, really love to shoot in. This is a fine image, it's great, but what happens when we make it black and white? What's the difference between these images? Why do I like the black and white one better? And I think it's pretty clear to me that it's just suddenly all of these textures become more obvious. All of these elements become more obvious. And the separation between the foreground objects and the background objects, they just become more separated. Let's look at that again. Because it's all the same, but it's not. I want to move to an image that I've put up on my Instagram it's just a classic me image and it's pretty much perfection in my world. And that is this image here. And it's hard for me to describe why I think this is perfect, but I'm going to try and tell you why I like it so much. Firstly, it's, it's actually really simple. It's a simple scene. We all know what's going on. There's nothing dramatic about it. It's familiar, it's, it's warm, it's inviting. But then somehow, contradictingly, conversely, it's complex and it's got scale and drama. And I think that's why I'm drawn to these sorts of images. They're both inviting, warm and friendly and dramatic at the same time. And I suppose that happens from it being something as simple as a cafe, which happens to have a view onto these massive 50-story buildings that are something like a kilometre away or half a kilometre away. Then we have the brutalist concrete structure, which is powerful and dramatic. But then we have the softness of almost fairy lights just streaming across the sky. There's the light. It's the midday winter's light, which is both harsh and strong, but also soft and painterly because the light is coming through so much more atmosphere than it normally does in our Australian summers. So it's strong but soft. Again, these two opposites creating something, to me, which is special. So to me, this is a great and powerful image as it stands. It's got perspective in the lines. I love perspective. It's got textures. I love textures. It's got layers. I love the layers for middle background. It's got signs of life, chairs, tables, lights, and it's got this beautiful, soft, painterly light. And other things I'm always trying to do these days, this is something that's been on my mind for probably over a decade now, is trying to get my verticals as vertical as possible, getting my horizontal line in the middle, 
Another thing that was important to me in this image was these shadows. I really wanted to show the shadows of the chairs and the table. And I really wanted to show the textures because I think the textures are also inviting in the table, in the shadows. There is just so many little subtle things which I have to say I don't really think about when I take the shots. But because I've done my 10,000 hours and I've probably done 50,000 hours at this point, so much of this stuff is just encoded in my brain and it's just in, innate. It's kind of automatic. It's in my DNA. Finding the verticals, making the horizontals, making sure the shadows are not cut off. And even the decision to have this area up here, this is deliberate. This was part of cutting into the frame and just showing the layers and the depth. So there's so much going on in this frame. It's actually really busy, yet it's still calm and simple. There's another juxtaposition. I think I love juxtapositions. I've always said, I've always, it's, it's something that I've thought about with my photography for years, is that I love creating serenity and balance out of chaos. And I think if you got the framing wrong with this, it could easily be very chaotic. So there's the basis of this image. Now what happens when we make it black and white? So what we'll do, and, and, and I just want to show you how I adjusted my framing, and, and I'm a little bit like a bird of prey circling its prey. I circle around until I find the optimal framing position. Look at this image here. It's different. I'm a bit higher. It's not as good. And I was zeroing in. And then here is the image that I settled on. I tried another one. I, I don't mind this one, but it doesn't quite have the same intimacy, I think. But it's very, very close to this one for me. Let's go back to the main one that I want to talk about in this video, and that's this one here. Now, firstly, I just want to have a look at what edits I've made to this so far. I think I have made a few minor edits so far. So I've brought up the contrast a little bit. I've brought up the shadows a little bit. I've brought down the blacks. So let's just take this back to where it was. This is pretty much what the image looked like as shot. And I know that I can bring up these shadows one or two, even three stops, and I've got absolutely no penalty. So that that is the image right there, sort of out of the box. Again, I'm preserving because I wanted to be able to see those clouds. That was important to me because it was a foggy day. So let's just bring everything back to where I took it to. Okay, so that's what I've done to it. Now, grayscale. Now we've got two options. We can work in Capture One, which allows some degree of black and white control. But the Nix software is something that I've used for a long time and I find it a piece of software that allows you to create very authentic looking black and white images. The only thing with it that you have to keep in mind is that if you want to work directly in Nix, you have to use TIFFs. Or you can work through Photoshop. So let's do that. Okay, so we can see here that the NYX collection, who I do not work for, I've got the latest version. They have this little shortcut that appears in Photoshop that allows you to use their tools as a layer, which is kind of a cute way of doing things. And we're going to use Silver FX Pro version 3. So you just click on that and it basically exports the file to the NYX software and then brings it back as a layer. And we can see once we get into this software, it's already got a really delicious medium format. And I know what medium format film looks like vibe going on because I've, I've owned a Mamiya RB67 and shot quite a lot of medium format film back in the 90s. And they've got some presets for you over here. You can click on those and you can go, that's cool. What am I trying to achieve? And you can just keep trying them out. For example, I like something like this because those things that I was talking about before have become even more. They're amplified just a little bit. The contrast, the texture, the lines, the textures here, the shadows, the lights, and these beautiful billowing foggy clouds, the brutalism of the concrete. Everything is just being popped in the appropriate way. And this is just one of their presets. 
I find that to be a little bit dark. Ultimately, when you get to this point here, you know, it comes down to your choices. What do you like? Do you like it brighter like this? Or would you prefer it to be a little bit more moody? Would you prefer it to have less contrast like this one does? I think I quite liked that one there. And every image will respond a little bit differently. That's just the way it works. Then you come over here and you can adjust absolutely every metric in this image. And you're just working in black and white. So we can make it brighter. Sure, we all know what that looks like. That's fine. You can just bring up the highlights. And you might go, I want those clouds to just be a bit more obvious. Or I want the differential in the texture to be more obvious. I want to bring up the midtones. No, I don't. You can go through here and you can experiment and make these images how your heart is most content. Like for me, the image has now lost too much contrast. I don't like that. So I'm not going to adjust that. I would say the image needs slightly more brightness than what it has. Maybe somewhere in there. Maybe that's a bit harsh. Again, there's no right or wrong here. It's so subjective. And I often find with my images, there's not one version that's the best version. This is why I try not to spend too much time in this sort of software because you can drive yourself mad trying to get what's best when there's really no one best. So I will just do a quick run through each of these settings, seeing whether I think adding or subtracting them is of benefit. Maybe I prefer it with a little less structure. It was just a bit too hyper contrasty. We'll take it to sort of almost the zero point. The structure adjustments are, are all around basically contrast. So what that did there is it made the highlights less contrasty. So if you look at these clouds here, and I prefer those clouds being accentuated. You also have the option to view how it came in versus what you've added. And that can be quite quite helpful. So if you're wanting to make really finely adjusted black and whites, I find this software to be very powerful and you really have very fine control. You can save your custom presets, but what I've found is is no two images are really that alike unless you took them side by side. So there's just a little overview of how I gently adjust things. It's very, very personal as to what you do. But I think the description about the image and the fact that a big part of what makes black and white work is sort of the construction of the image. And as I said just before, shape, line, form, shadow, texture, perspective, depth, foreground, middle ground, background. This image has a lot of elements in it that bring it all together and for me make it a very compelling image. Well, everybody, I hope that little snapshot of how I love to edit some of my images in black and white helped. Silver FX Pro, I think, is the best piece of software so far that I've stumbled across for creating quite authentic black and white looks. And there are near on endless packs and filters and ways of creating black and white. There's no right or wrong one way. And I'm certainly not working for any of these companies. But I've been enjoying Nix for, I don't know, maybe something like a decade when it was originally owned by Google and they used to give it away. And then they sold it off to people who started charging money for it. It's a weird old world, isn't it? Do let me know, do you use Nix? And if you don't use Nix, I'd love to know what is your favorite way of creating black and whites to give you the most authentic outcomes. Because that's super important to me and I'd love to continue to experiment and find even better options if they exist. And please also tell me, do you even create black and whites? Is this something that you do? And if you don't do it, would you consider it? I think they're very powerful. There's a certain serenity, a certain magic, and I do think that they tell the photographic story in a different way. If this is your first time here, I'd love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. It is so fantastic for the channel. If you like the video, it helps get it out there. It helps the channel grow. I look forward to seeing you very soon. And if you like any of the images that you see in this video, you can reach out to me via email 
and I can create a print for you. The pricing is all up on the website and of course there's many images on the website as well. That's at mattirwin.com. I will see you very soon.